starting a little bit later than we had anticipated. Uh, we're going to get the Pension and Health Benefits Committee meeting underway. First order of business is roll call. Priya Mother. Good morning. George Deere. Here. Michael Bilbrey. Present. Ralph Cobb for Julie Chapman. Here. Terry McGuire for John Chung. Here. Rob Fechner. Here. JJ Jelensic. Yes. Henry Jones. Here. Grant Boykin for Bill Ocure. Here. Okay, we are at this time uh, going to actually take a short recess for a closed session. I apologize, I know you've all just gotten comfortable, um, but an issue has come up, so we need to take a 20 minute uh, recess. Our plan is to come back into open session at about, my guess is probably 10 past 10. So I'm gonna ask the, you to clear the room. We're going to recess and go into closed. We're gonna reconvene the open session of the Health Benefits Committee. I want to thank the public for your indulgence. Uh, apologize for that um, brief closed session, but we're going to go ahead with the agenda on for the public session, uh, open session agenda. For next order of business is agenda item two, executive report. Uh, Ms. Lum, did you have an executive report? Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Donna Lund, CalPER staff. I have two brief updates to share with you this morning uh, in my executive report. The first is related to the fund lineup changes for the supplemental income program. As you recall, in May, we provided the committee an overview of the fund lineup changes uh, that were being made to the supplemental income program. And over the course of the last few months, the team has designed and implemented an extensive communication plan to ensure that our SIP participants understood the fund change and the transitions. Uh, we had a lot of communication that went out to both the participants and the employers. We also did specific uh, webinars and outreach um, that we invited participants to, um, to attend, as well as our employers. On October 2nd, um, a participant quiet period went into effect, uh, which began the fund transition. Uh, we called this a quiet period and it went from October 2nd to October 7th. Um, our investment office working with their external vendors completed the asset transition and participants had access to their accounts after six o'clock on October 7th. So in essence, I'm just pleased to share with you that um, the overall transition of the effort was successful and our post transition communication to our participants was sent last week. Um, so again, just a very brief update on the, uh, the SIP fund line, lineup transition. The second update that I wanted to share with you uh, is related to our customer contact service uh, center um, service levels for the 2013 open enrollment period, which concluded this past Friday. Um, our contact center agents answered over 85,000 calls from members and employers and our service levels and the call wait times were extraordinarily high, or excuse me, extraordinarily low, um, considering the volume and where we've been with our call wait times. Our average wait time was at one minute for actual members and employers who waited on the line. Um, more than 92% of all the calls were answered in under six minutes, and our virtual hold only came into uh, play less than 6% of all of those calls. So we do attribute the success of um, the, uh, the, the role that the contact center agents had in our uh, open enrollment period, um, primarily to a couple of um, items. One, we did augment temporarily and redirect some of the internal um, customer service and outreach division staff to assist with this effort. Um, but we also took advantage of the technology changes that I have been uh, sharing with you over the last year with regards to contact center technology, our skill-based routing, um, and our modified training plans uh, that are very specific for the agents for this type of a situation. So again, just very pleased to let you know that um, we've come through the period and certainly you'll get reports um, shortly about the overall open enrollment um, changes that were made, but I just wanted to uh, reassure you and share with you that the contact center agents did a fantastic job handling the, the volume that they had. And that concludes my report. Terrific, that's great news, thank you. Good morning. 
Just a couple of brief updates for you before we uh, dive into the agenda. First, on the Dependent Eligibility Verification Project, of course, we are in full swing on the verification phase of this project. As you remember, uh, due to the large number of dependents that we have to verify during this project, we are dividing the, the verification into cycles. We recently completed cycle one and are currently in cycle two. There are seven more to follow and this will extend into the spring of 2015. So it's a very long process uh, given how many uh, dependents we have. In July, our vendor, HMS, issued the first verification letters to 47,634 subscribers in Cycle 1. Collectively, these subscribers have more than 106,000 dependents on their health plans. Some Cycle 1 highlights uh, to date are that HMS has verified more than 94,144 dependents, so we're very pleased about that. The overall response rate is approximately 92%, really right on target for where we would expect it to be. Of the 92%, 86.8%, so 41,000 more or less subscribers have completed the verification, and then 5.5, about 3,000, uh, 2,600 have submitted only partial documentation, so we are uh, continuing to work with them. 7.7% uh, did not submit any uh, documentation or respond to the uh, to HMS's letters. During cycle one, HMS received approximately 15,430 phone calls into their call center. And of those, only about 365 were escalated to CalPERS staff for resolution. The most common escalation centered on um, accepting foreign documents covering ex-spouses and verification of uh, parent-child relationships. Our staff work daily with HMS to review the cases and ensure that the processes are working well. In some cases, uh, we have contacted members directly to discuss their situation or convey a resolution. We are flexible with subscribers uh, to allow them to complete verification and keep their dependence on their plan. Our desire, of course, is never to disenroll someone who is appropriately eligible. Uh, so for example, one subscriber is out of the country for several months and would not be back in time to gather and submit the documents. Another had the unfortunate experience of losing everything in a flood. Uh, we, in both situations, we've moved these uh, members to a later cycle to allow them time to uh, comply. Just last week, staff completed a seminar and teleconference for employers in cycle one to outline next steps in the process. Uh, as part of these next steps, at the end of this week, HMS will prepare reports for employers that identify ineligible dependents to be disenrolled. So these are the people where we haven't had any response from the subscriber or the documentation has been insufficient to demonstrate that relationship. Uh, we are requesting that employers disenroll ineligible dependents within five to seven days of receiving that report. We will, of course, with HMS, continue to work with all subscribers who contact them at this point. Sometimes it does take that final threat uh, for people to pay attention to verify eligibility and we'll notify employer, uh, employers about those employees who provide us with the documentation that allows them to remain on. If a subscriber does not provide supporting documentation for their disenrolled dependents, uh, those dependents will remain disenrolled. HMS will officially close out cycle one. As we continue to work with active state subscribers in cycles one and two, uh, they are pre we're preparing for the next group to be verified in cycles three and four, which are the state retirees. HMS will send out the first a batch of letters to state retirees on December 2nd. These retirees will have until J January 21st to submit their documents. The second group of state retirees will receive their letters around February 3rd, and they will have until March 21st to complete their documentation. In addition to the usual letters uh, that they send to subscribers in each cycle, we will also be, HMS will also be providing automated outbound telephone messages for retirees. These messages will remind them of the key dates and the HMS contact number to call if they have any questions. Uh, we are also, of course, welcome uh, any and all support from our stakeholder and partner organizations uh, in spreading the word and, and easing the uh, response to, uh, to, these, uh, to the Dependent Eligibility Verification Project. 
there are no questions about that. I um, there is a question, actually. Mr. Jelinsek. Yes. C can you repeat those dates? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the first batch of letters for state retirees will go out on December 2nd. They will have until January 21st to comply. The second group uh, will receive their letters uh, about February 3rd, and they will have until March 21st to reply. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. The second item I just wanted to uh, give you a very brief update on is, uh, as you recall, last year, about uh, May of last year, the governor issued an executive order directing uh, Secretary Diana Dooley from the Health and Human Services Agency to convene a Let's Get Healthy task force, which was charged with identifying strategies across the state to improve the overall health status of Californians, statewide, public, and private. As a follow-on to that, uh, the, uh, our CEO, Ann Stossball, was appointed to that task force, and I supported it in a technical capacity. Uh, as our overall, as a part of the follow-on for this, uh, Secretary Dooley subsequently has obtained uh, financing from the federal government through the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Innovation, a planning grant for a payment reform uh, strategy statewide. I have been participating in this group uh, over the past several months with other state purchasers, in particular uh, the Department of Healthcare Services and Covered California. On April 1st, that, that was the date that we were awarded, uh, that she was awarded, the State um, Innovation Model Grant from CMMI. And it's to develop a three-year testing grant that the state would implement. The draft of this has been released to stakeholders. Uh, we are uh, targeting, the Secretary is targeting having that completed in November. Uh, the second round of this will be a request for financing to support some of these projects that have been identified. Yet some of the initiatives identified um, in this document center around care coordination, including um, team-based care and linking with community programs. They are projects which uh, we would expect that we will, we, we will be coming forward to you with proposals for how we can support these initiatives with our, uh, within our health benefits program. They include um, maternity care, health homes for complex patients, very similar to the uh, priority care project, which we are currently sponsoring in Humboldt County, palliative care, um, and there's a concept of accountable care communities built into this. I don't expect that we will be participating in that process. Uh, the pro project overall has been uh, very collaborative and I think is a significant step forward for the state of California in articulating ways that both public and private sector can uh, collaborate, particularly the public purchasers, in really changing how care is delivered and the payment strategies within the state. That concludes my report, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you. I see no questions, questions at this time, so we'll move on to agenda item number three, approval of the minutes. With the pleasure of the committee. Mm -hmm. Moved by Dr. Deere, seconded by Mr. Jones. Did you say? I wasn't sure if I, who I heard on this side. Seconded by Mr. Jones. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. All those opposed, motion passes. I heard no requests for agenda item four, consent items, so we'll move on to agenda item number five, long-term care. Mr. Jelinsek? Um, on 4C, I have what I think is a quick question. Uh, let me, if it, Why if don't I you can, offer the question, and we can see if staff is prepared to answer it other, yeah, otherwise we'll move to the end pull. of the agenda. Um, it's on attachment one, two, page two of two, um, the returns for the one and three month period um, are above the benchmark, which is good, but they're negative. And I was just wondering what that is. I'm sorry, Mr. Jelensky, could you please repeat the question? Uh, oh, this, I'm Rand Anderson uh, Calpers. Okay. Uh, it's on attachment one, two of two. The investment performance for period, the one and three month periods, I noticed they beat the benchmark, but they are negative, and as is the benchmark. And I was just wondering what, what happened in that period. Well, uh, I think that would more properly be uh, answered by the investment office. Um, and I'm I th I, may I suggest, Mr. Jelinsic, that you have that conversation offline with the investment staff? Okay, I, I can do that. Okay. Thank okay. you. Sorry, I can't. Uh, 
accommodate. No, thank you. That's fine. Um, okay, we'll move on now to agenda item number five, long-term care program annual valuation. Thank you. Uh, before uh, Mr. Mr. Lemro uh, begins, uh, just a, a quick stage setting for you. Uh, two items to note. Uh, the uh, what staff are presenting today as an action item is the acceptance of the long-term care valuation, the annual valuation with the date of June 30th, 2013. We know that the issue overall of the status of the fund and most particularly the 85% rate increase, which is slated to be uh, put into effect in January 15, is an item of continuing and appropriate interest for all stakeholders and for the committee. Next month, we will be bringing to you for uh, as an information item some scenarios that demonstrate what different kinds of um, circumstances would have on the overall fund. So changes in funded status, if you were to reconsider the rate increase itself, uh, what, the, what those kinds of things might have on the fund. We are not at this point today prepared to respond to those uh, questions, uh, but we will be respond. We do know it's important. We will be responding to those, uh, presenting that to you next month as an information item in this committee. Then the second point uh, that I would make is this report as evaluation. Uh, this is the last time that this will be before this committee. We will, of course, provide you with information, uh, but the acceptance of the valuations uh, is, that is delegated through your committee charters to the Finance and Administration Committee. Uh, we brought it here given all of the action that has been happening around the fund over the past two years. Uh, but next year's valuation, uh, this time next year, you will need to tune in to the Finance and Administration Committee uh, to receive the valuation for the Long-Term Care Fund. With that, thank you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, good morning. My name is Chair, Committee Members, David Lamoureux, Calper Staff. Uh, we're asking the committee to approve the June 30, 2013 actual valuation for the long-term care program. What I'd like to point out is this is the first time ever that we've done the actual valuation in-house. I have with me to my right here Flora Hu, who is the long-term care actuary that we hired about a year ago to help us bring the actual program in-house. Since then, we've hired one more staff. His name is Danny Miller, who's been supporting Flora. And I would just like to take the opportunity right now to recognize the hard work they both did throughout the year. It was a challenge to develop our own internal actual evaluation system for the long-term care program. They both put in a lot of long hours to make it happen, to make sure we were able to deliver evaluation in time today for you. Uh, the last few years, we had United Health Actual Services to do the evaluation. And I would just like to point out that we did work closely with UHAS this time around, and they did help us validate the results that are in front of you. Um, as you can see from the valuation report, the results from this valuation are very good. Uh, we've had an over 24% improvement in the margin of the program. We now have a margin of close to 20% for the long-term care program. And I'll pass it over to Flora at this point. She'll point to you some of the, what were some of the key uh, reasons why we have a, such an uh, improvement in margin. Flora. Good morning, Madam Chair, Board of Members, Flora Ho, CARPO staff. Over the last two fiscal year, the funded status improved from 96% to 123%. And the program went from a deficit of 4.66% to a margin of 19.66%. This valuation report reflects the stabilization plan that was approved by the board in October 2012, which included the 85% rate increases for certain policies and permitted policy conversions for participants to move to a less expensive plan. In developing the stabilization plan adopted by the board, a 10% conversion rate was assumed. The actual conversion rate has been as high as 28% for a subset of participants who were given the option to convert in 2013. The higher than expected conversion rate improved both the margin and the funded status. Last year, uh, the program suffered an investment loss. The actual investment return was about 3.4%, which was lower than the assumed 5.75%. The 
The table on page three of the agenda item provides you with a detailed breakdown of the reason for the improvement in margin. It is important to remember that the margin of the program is very sensitive to the key assumptions. If the actual experiences deviate from the current best estimate, the margin of the program could drop below 10%. The valuation report contains a section of risk analysis that illustrates how sensitive the valuation results are to those key actuarial assumptions. The risk analysis can be found on page 19 of the valuation report. For example, the table on page 19 shows that the margin of the program could go down by more than 10% if the investment return were to be a half percent lower than the assumed in the future. That concludes my report. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. I, I want to commend you on a very good report. I, it's amazing to read act, an actuarial report that's actually in plain English. So <laughs> thank you. I thank, thank you. you. I, I imagine that um, our, our audience, our public thanks you as well. Um, but really good job. Mr. Jones. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. I also want to commend you on a very, very good report because when I started to reading, I noticed something was different. It was easier to read. <laughs> so that's a very, very uh, a movement in the right direction. I, I just like to, to, to highlight for a moment on page uh, on your report itself in, in the body of the uh, board report on page four or five. Um, the five-year history of funded status uh, and margin, and I and I can't stress enough that you know when we look at this and we said 19.66 and we said well we're out of the water and we could go back to the business as usual, but again this is just one year, and we all know that uh, things can go up and they can go down, so we need to look at this from the long term, not just go and rest on our laurels because of one good year just like our pension benefits. So we need to just keep moving this uh, program in the same direction until we really get a high margin where we have uh, what we can call a rainy day, a fund to support this program. Thank you so much. Mr. Cobb. Yeah, I also would want to compliment you on the work on the report. I mean, it's head and shoulders above prior reports. And I'm one who's probably spent as much or more time than most dissecting the valuations over the years. Um, on the conversions, uh, one thing I, I saw in the valuation that I thought was really interesting was that although the conversion rate of 28% <coughs> was much higher than the assumption of 10%, it looks like in some of your work that you discovered that not all conversions are created equal. And so the effective rate of the conversions, you can't compare the 28 and the 10. Really, what we compare to the 10 is probably something less than 28. And I'm just curious if the, you guys had kind of a benchmark of what did we really achieve relative to the assumption? You know, was it 20 or was it high teens? Oh. Uh Based on this year's conversion rate, um, we uh, looked very carefully at the attend age group to see uh, uh, what specific age group have more conversions. Uh, we prefer to, in the development of the stabilization plan, the 10% conversion rate was assumed to be equally across all age groups. Right. So by now, based on the reality, the actual experiences, we see quite some differences. Uh, the, in 2013, actually, uh, the conversion rates uh, are for the most for the largest group for those policies who are going to get a rate increase in 2015. So the current conversion rates will will see no much differences in the next two following years. So 28 percent conversion rate uh, does not equally bring a 28 uh, percent increase in margin. Uh, the actual increase um, from this higher than expected conversion is about a 4% increase in the margin. 
Thank you. Mr. Deer. Healthcare is such a funny business. They could call, uh, we say that the investment, investments went up by 3.4%, but we call it an investment loss. That's, it, on the other hand, if, if uh, healthcare costs go up by 3%, we say it's a decrease because they usually go up by 6 So anyhow, it's hard for me to get my head straight about some of these things. I always thought things above zero were positive and below were negative. But nonetheless, page 40, oh, excuse me, page 11 of the valuation report, uh, page 44 in the, in the board books, comparison of current and prior years. Uh, and this may have been in your dis uh, um, discussion, but the present value of future benefits decreased by um, almost $600 million. And, do you, and to what uh, is that attributable? The, this is mostly due to the, all the members that have converted to less expensive policy. So now we expect I to pay see. less benefits for them going forward. Okay. So it, this is where you can see the, the real impact of members uh, electing to a less expensive policy. Okay, and on page Appendix A, uh, page 13, Board Books, page 76, Appendix A, page 13. And this occurs in other tables, too. Um, I don't know, I, I actually don't know exactly how you do this, but, um, you know, for 2013 through 2023, you can, you can take the numbers and come up with the fund balance. Right, just but then, but then you sit. You're going by tenure increments. You're showing annual amounts, and yet the there's the fund balance comes crashing down. And I don't know how. Maybe there should be a just a footnote in the future, or you put something so that a pe person can kind of. Because when I first looked at that, I thought, my goodness, we have only two hundred and seventy nine million in claims, and we uh, lost. Uh, $5 billion, where did the money go? And then I saw that they were 10-year increments. So that's all, and, and everybody else, as I told you offline too, great, great job, uh, thank you. Yeah, on this table, just to make a, a funny comment, the first time I saw the version of the report, it was as in prior years when you has had presented 64 years, yeah. which and unless don't... you had magnifying glasses, there's no way you could read every, a, a single number. Yeah, so we, we decided after the first 10 years to only show once every 10 years. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's good. Just maybe some little explanation. So yeah. somebody okay. Tries to add. We'll, we'll take note of that. Thank you. Mr. Jelensic. Well, th there's some value in making the print small enough that we can't read it. Um, one of the things I noticed is that we, we have an investment loss. Um, and one of the things that we did previously is we adopted a more conservative allocation uh, so we put more fixed in income in there that led to the re the assumption of a lower return and yet we were below that um, and with the perf we actually did something a little different we left more equity we assumed a higher return and we outperformed it um, and i just want to point out that that doesn't you know, adopting a more conservative assumption doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be more likely to meet or beat the rate. Correct. I mean, it really is a re reaction to what the market does in the asset allocation that we're in. A lower risk doesn't necessarily mean that we're more likely to beat the return. Thank you. Thank you. I do think this language of calling it an investment loss, even though we didn't lose money, maybe an investment underperformance would be a better terminology. Or oh, we should call it an actuarial loss. Is actuarial really loss. Is it was because, the return was because, lower than actuarially than the actually assumed return? Yeah. We'll so maybe just for future reports, Correct. we can consider we that. Uh, Mr. Cobb. Oh, um, sorry. Go ahead. Something I'd like us to think about and consider for future valuations is getting rid of the funded status metric. We've always, from the outset of the long-term care program, used the margin. And then, just in the last couple of years, threw in that funded status. And to me, it kind of, you know, one of our sins of the early years was looking at the long-term care product through the lens of a pension program and this kind of throws a pension like 
metric in there, and it really duplicates the margin. And like you indicated in the the um, in the valuation, that when one goes up, the other goes up, and when one goes down, the other goes down. So I really don't see the utility of having both. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Again, <clears throat> on this. Uh, page uh, 55 of our book uh, to expand a little bit on JJ's comment about changing our discount rate our asset allocation uh, I think that could you comment to expand or respond to his question by expanding on the impact of a half a percent increase up and a half a percent it's more sensitive in this fund than it would be the perf in terms of this movement and the effect of a very small change in the assumptions as you list here on page uh, whatever it was uh, in scenario descriptions you got the best case and then it, you could show that a half a percent would uh, go from our current 19.66 but if you change by half a percent and including the discount rate the mobility rate and, and, and goes to negative 21 percent that's how wide these margins are so could you comment Correct. on that yes i can the, the first thing i want to point out is what you look at on page 22 we were looking at best and worst cases right. so it's right. a combination of not only a lower discount rate a lower investment return but it's also what if everything went wrong right lower than expected return more people going on clean so if all the assumptions kind of went the wrong way this is kind of your worst case so and i think I, we've never sort of really done that on the pension side, so uh, I think if we did something similar on the pension side, you probably would see something similar as well. But it is uh, if you're if someone is interested in just looking at each assumption one, one at a time, page 19, for example, shows the impact of a lower investment return only, which that if you look would be very similar to what you would see on the pension side. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jelinek. Ralph, I think there actually is value in having both the margin and the funded status because it, the margin is just a dollar amount and the funded status puts it in relationship to what the liabilities are. So I, I think there actually is a, an advantage to having both. Okay, uh, we do have one member of the public who wishes to speak. Tim Behrens, will you please make your way to the front? Identify yourself and your affiliation for the record, and you'll have three minutes okay. to speak. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Pension Health Benefits Committee. I'm Tim Behrens, uh, president of the California State Retirees, the largest state retiree organization in California. As you know, our organization helped CalPERS get out the important message that, Cal, that the members of CalPERS long-term care might want to migrate to less expensive plans in order to keep their premium costs down, as well as strengthen the overall program. Instead of the 10% migration that CalPERS had hoped for, 26% of the long-term care program members migrated to lesser plans. This will result in a great savings to the program. The funded status of the program is now 123% percent compared to 96 percent in 2012. The program's margin is 19.66 compared to negative 4.66 in 2012. It only goes to reason that the money saved by the migrations and the CalPERS stabilization plan should go to the people who were hardest hit during the many hefty premium hikes to long-term care participants in recent years. We understand that figures change from year to year, but the program has experienced significant savings right now for the first time in a very long time. Long-term care members have been patiently waiting for such a day, and they deserve to reap some of the benefits now, not years from now. I'd like to thank you for your consideration. The California State Retirees also believes the CalPERS Board should examine the various reasons why the long-term care plan suffered investments losses during the 2012-2013 fiscal year. The program had a return of just 3.4% instead of the 5.75% investment assumption. We understand that long-term care investments are more conservative than the CalPERS pension plan, which earned 12.5% during the same time period. But the difference between 3.4 and 12.5% in earnings is strikingly enough to merit further study. Thank you for your time. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Hey. <laughs> you did. Okay, we'll now move on to agenda item number six, termination of participation in PEMCA. Ms. Lum. Good morning again, Donna Lum, CalPERS staff. Oh, agenda I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. I think that that was an action item, wasn't yes. it? We needed to, we needed a, a motion from the committee. Sorry. If you could just pause a moment. Is there Second. mission made by Mr. Jelinsic, seconded by Mr. Deere. In favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed. Motion passes. Thank you. Now we'll move on to agenda item number six. Certainly. So agenda item number six is also an action item, and staff recommends the committee terminate the Southern Inyo Healthcare District contract uh, for PEMCA benefits effective October 31st, 2013, pursuant to Government Code Section 22939. So just by way of background, um, Southern Inyo is a PEMCA-only participating agency with a history of delinquent monthly health premiums. Uh, their current outstanding balance is $104,882.25. On September 18, 2013, um, Southern Inyo's governing body adopted a resolution to terminate PEMCA coverage, and they are requesting that CalPERS approve the termination effective October 31, 2013. In addition, uh, the CFO sent a letter, which is attachment number one on your iPad, it's on page 124, also requesting that CalPERS terminate the health care coverage um, effective October 31st. There is no legal authority for Southern Inyo to unilaterally terminate their contract outside of government code section 22938, which requires their board to pass a resolution to terminate with an effective date at the end of the current contract year. In order to lawfully terminate the contract prior to the end of the contract year, Government Code Section 22939 must be followed, which requires our Board of Administration at, to take action. Um, in communications with Southern Inyo, um, they have indicated that they have been in regular and constant communication with their uh, employees regarding their intent to terminate PEMCA. In addition, they recently secured um, health care insurance with a carrier for their employees. I also wanted to let you know that on October 3rd, a demand letter was sent from CalPERS to Southern Inyo uh, for the outstanding um, balance that is due, which is $104,882.25. So this concludes uh, my presentation, and I'm available to answer questions. Thank you. Mr. Fechner. Yes, thank you. How long have they been in the system? Do you know? Oh, uh, I do not have that information. I can get back to you on I, that. My, my only reason we're asking is it just seems like it's odd that there's no retirees with that group. And I always wondered how if they were new or if it's a, a new contracting agency or whatever. But as you read through it, they have some 40 some actives and no retirees. Um, Mr. Rector, I'd have to get back that information. Okay, I don't fine, have it you. currently with me. Thank you, Mr. Deere. Do we do we continue to pursue uh, the collection of the uh, money that's owed? Then yes, we will, and that was part of the demand letter that was sent as well. Thank you, Mr. Jelinsic. And following up on that, do we do we have any reason to expect that we're not going to be able to recover the hundred and four thousand um, dollars? In conversations that um, our staff have had with the CFO, we do know that there's a cycle of timing. Um, in which they do get additional funds, and it's primarily when they get their tax uh, funding. However, there's been no communication that guarantees or commits um, within a certain time frame that they will um, pay the outstanding balance, but we are, we are working through our legal office with them. And my understanding is that all of these employees are non-represented. That's correct. I will move staff's recommendation. Thank you. Moved by Jelinsic. Is there a second? Second. I'm sorry, seconded by Fechner. All those in favor, say, uh, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes. Aye. Thank you very much. We can move on to agenda item number seven, prescription drugs utilization and cost trends. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the Pension and Health Benefits Committee. This agenda item provides an update on the CalPERS PPO and HMO health plans pharmacy programs. 
Staff analyzed prescription drug utilization and cost data for basic Medicare and association plan members using the CalPERS healthcare decision support system and data for all of our health plans between 2009 and 2012. To my left, Dr. Melissa Mantong, CalPERS pharmacist, will present her program report, which will cover prescription drug program statistics, member pays the difference program savings, and statistics on specialty drug utilization and cost. Melissa. Good morning, Madam Chair, morning. members of the committee. Melissa Mantong, CalPERS pharmacist. This is an informational item. I will review prescription trends and costs, generic dispensing trends, member pays the difference program savings, and specialty drug trends. Let's begin with prescription costs and prescription number trends from 2009 to 2012. There is a correction on the slide. The allowed amount shown is the total, not per prescription as indicated. Using 2009 as the baseline, the 2012 CalPERS allowed amount increased 10.3%, and the number of prescriptions written increased 4.35%. The allowed amount is the discount amount CalPERS and our members paid. Some possible reasons that the allowed amount dropped from 12.99% in 2011 to 10.3% in 2012 are pharmacy benefit manager change, member pace of difference, program implementation, and blockbuster brands went off patents. CalPERS prescription drug spending accounted for 21% of our total health care expenditure. Next, we will look at generic dispensing trends from 2009 to 2012 for each of our health plans. FDA approved generic drugs have the same active ingredients and are chemically bioequivalent to the brand drug whose patent has expired. Compared to the brand drug, the generic drug is equally effective and less expensive. This results in significant savings opportunity for CalPERS and our members. The generic dispensing rate is the percent of all payable prescriptions that were dispensed as generic drugs. From 2009 to 2012, the generic dispensing rate increased it for all plans. As the graph illustrates, HMO plans have higher generic dispensing rates than PPO plans. This is likely due to healthcare integration and more structured prescription drug utilization management in HMO plans. This slide shows the contrast to the increasing prescription costs and number shown earlier. On the fourth row, note that member cost share remained stable. The first row shows the number of scripts for all prescriptions from 2009 to 2012. The second row shows the allowed amount for all prescriptions in millions. The member cost share percentage is the member cost share amount, the third row, divided by allowed amount, the second row, converted to percentage. The member cost share percent for all prescriptions was 12.5% in 2009 and 13.1% in 2012. In comparison, the 2011 national average member cost share for all prescriptions for large employers was 23%. Now I will discuss member pays a difference program. The program was implemented January 1, 2012. In this program, as illustrated by the example on the slide, if a brand name drug is selected when a generic drug is available, the member pays the difference in the cost between the brand name drug and the generic drug, plus the generic copay. CalPERS has an exception process from prescribers to request exception to the member pays a difference on the basis of medical necessity. With medical necessity exception approval, our member pays only the non-preferred brand copay. Otherwise, as illustrated in this example, the member pays $90 for Zocor. $85 is a difference in cost between the brand and generic drug, 
plus 5% generic copay, or $5 for generic symphostatin. With this background, let's look at the estimated total member pays a difference program savings for 2011, I'm sorry, for 2012. Of the $6.7 million total savings, $3 million savings for Blue Shield and $3.7 million savings for CVS Caremark. The amounts in the blue bars or the bottom boxes are savings due to increased member cost sharing for applicable brand drugs. The majority of savings, as shown by the green bars, resulted from members who switched it from brand to generic drugs. Next, I will discuss specialty drugs. The table illustrates the top 10 specialty drugs by allowed amount. No industry standard definition exists for specialty drugs. Specialty drugs are generally classified as high risk, high cost, mostly injectable drugs. Therefore, the data shown used at CVS Caremark specialty drug criteria across all plans. The top 10 specialty drugs are primarily used for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, cancer, and multiple sclerosis. Specialty drugs accounted for less than one half percent of, total, of the total drugs and are utilized by less than 2% of our members. However, specialty drug costs accounted for a disproportionately large percentage of the total drug costs. This table illustrates an increasing trend from 2009 to 2012 for specialty drugs. The number of scripts increased it. Specialty drugs scripts as a percentage of all prescriptions increased from 0.37% in 2009 to 0.49% in 2012. Specialty drug allow amount increased from $146 million in 2009 to $254 million in 2012. Specialty drug allowed amount as a percentage of the total drug cost increased from 11% in 2009 to 17.3% in 2012. The member cost share percentage remained stable at less than 1%. It is important to note that specialty drug costs are expected to reach 50% of our total drug costs by 2018. Driven by high cost of specialty drugs, expanded, ex expanded indications, and a robust specialty pipeline. When the specialty preferred drug plan for 2014, you made an important initial step in managing specialty drug costs in three selected therapeutic categories. For the three selected therapeutic categories, the projected savings total between four to five million dollars over three years. In summary, prescription costs continue to increase, driven by utilization, inflation, and high-cost pharmaceuticals. Generic dispensing rates continue to increase and are expected to increase due to member pays the difference and several upcoming brand patent expirations. Both will lead to substantial savings for CalPERS and our members. However, savings from increased generic utilization are outpaced by rapidly increasing specialty drug costs. Among other saving programs, cost-effective management strategies for specialty drugs need to be a priority to manage the rapid cost growth. CalPERS staff will continue to explore options for controlling expenditures on prescription drugs while maintaining member choice and healthcare quality. This concludes my presentation, and I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. We do have a couple questions from the committee. Mr. Jones? Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Mintong, on your page six of your deck, and I guess it's 133 of our, uh, 133 of our uh, book, uh, where you showed the, the uh, difference in terms of brand versus generic. And I know that last year, 
a number of our members had complaints about having the need for medical reasons, but were not able to to uh, get that uh, approved through the process. And I know that something was done and worked on. So I just want to get an update on. I see you indicate that you have CalPERS as a process now. So what is that process and how does it work? Yes. Um, so both Blue Shield and CVS Caremark do have process for prescribers to request member pays the difference exception on the basis of medical necessity. So general um, reasons for approving medical necessity is a patient tried it and failed a generic treatment. So either the patient did not respond to it or have an adverse event. So with that documentation, then the member pays a different exception is approved. And the approval rate for CVS Caremark is about 95% of the request. And for Blue Shield, is about 75 to 80% approval rate. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Cobb. Um, uh, first, I want to compliment you on a really very good, clear report. And, you know, I, you know, I agree that the potential downstream impact of the specialty drugs is, could be pretty significant. It seems to me that even with uh, preferred specialty drug strategy and even with maybe some beginning of introduction of biosimilars, even both of those put together, the savings from those aren't going to even come close to offsetting the cost impact from the growth in specialty prescription volume. So I think that it might be a good thing for us to see, you know, what, what does the downstream rate pressures look like from this? And then look at maybe beyond just the specialty or even beyond prescription drugs totally at how, you know, what kind of strategies can we use in other areas of the program to basically you know, make room for the increasing um, specialty drug expenditures to take pressure off of the rates as a whole. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. We do have one member of the public who wishes to speak on this item, Mr. Ramon Castelblanc, if you could make your way forward. Um, take your seat and uh, uh, Tell us your name and affiliation for the record, and you'll have three minutes. Um, before you start, Mr. Deere, did you want to say something? Bef it's not on yet. And if, actually, before you start, I'm just going to have Mr. Deere uh, make a comment. Uh, your member, your charts on uh, number of scripts uh, allowed amount. It might be interesting to see the, the the trends in cost per script on both the specialty and I can we can divide, but. I think that would be an interesting statistic. Also, the member cost share, I believe, I'll hypothesize that as more and more generics are used, the member's cost share probably goes up, right? They're, the cost goes down, but the cost share goes up because the generic copay is a higher percentage of the total. That's exactly the point. The member cost share percentage I presented is for all prescriptions. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. The cost share will be different for generic, for non-preferred brand, and for preferred brand. But it but it should not and look it, like the the members actually the members actually paying less in total. Yeah. Because yeah. the employer anyway. Yeah. Thank you. That's a good point. Thank you, Mr. Castelblanc. Good morning, good morning. Uh, Chair um, and. Uh, members of the committee. I speak today, this is Ramon Costablanc. I'm a member of the California Faculty Association Health Benefits Committee. Uh, I was here a year or so ago and we heard a report, in fact I helped make it, uh, that there was $56 million of potential savings uh, uh, available through uh, generic substitution. Uh, we looked at a report that showed that Kaiser uh, did considerably better at uh, generic substitution, just as you saw uh, in this presentation. Uh, and one of the key reasons Kaiser is better is because they actively invest in what we called last year academic detailing, that is, uh, educating prescribers as to what their options are between generic and uh, branded drugs. Uh, this was something that uh, when, when we made a report last August, I understood was going to be addressed uh, in the request for proposals that went out to insurers last year. They're going to be asked, what are they going to do on something like academic detailing? Uh, are they going to uh, invest uh, as Kaiser has, or what other ideas do they have to promote generic substitution? 
Uh, when I came to the PERS board meeting six months ago, I heard a report from the staff that said uh, that all the plans were something like above average. I can't remember the exact words anymore, but there was a quality category for all of the plans, and we were sort of in Lake Wobegon uh, with all above average plans in terms of uh, how they promoted quality and I think uh, uh, you know appropriate cost containment. So it doesn't appear uh, that anything was done along the lines of promoting anything like academic detailing over the past year or through the bid process. Uh, and I would guess uh, if there was $56 million of potential savings on the table last year uh, through generic substitution, there probably is a comparable amount on the table this year. Uh, and so my question uh, is why uh, was anything done around this academic detailing idea? Uh, were the insurers asked about it? Uh, did any of them respond that they might do something about it? Uh, are we probably still looking at $50 million in uh, potential savings, something like $50 million uh, through uh, generic substitution? Uh, these are the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe we could, and you or one of your staff could have a conversation with Mr. Hasselblad. Certainly. Uh, Dr. Donaldson would be happy to speak with him after. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Well, that um, concludes agenda item number seven. So we'll move on to agenda item number eight, which is uh, public comment. We have one member of the public who wishes to speak, Ms. Snodgrass. If you could come forward and make your comments. Good morning. Thank you, morning. Madam Chair. Uh, Donna Snodgrass, Director of Legislation, Retired Public Employees Association, and congratulations, Mr. Jelensic and Bill Bray, on your re-elections. Um, in the past, I've come with personal issues, and I've been very critical of Kaiser Permanente and their uh, care and administration. I am very happy to say that I have a 180-degree uh, report on Kaiser. I don't know what they've done internally, but our experiences even between North and South since August 3rd of this year um, has been completely different than in the past. So I wanted to give some kudos because I've been very critical in the past. Um, and I'll run through it very quickly because it gets even, even better even up to yesterday. Uh, on August 3rd, Ray, if, if you've noticed, he has not been with me for a while. He broke his leg at home, which required surgery. The new hospital in Fontana is like nothing I've ever experienced before in my life. It is outstanding, beginning with the emergency room all the way through the surgical, uh, the surgical part of that new hospital. Um, in the emergency room, we were treated very um, professionally, quickly. Uh, I, it's just amazing. Then on August 19th, the surgery was performed, and again, the staff, medical and non-medical, um, we've never been treated this well by any hospital or, or medical facility. And then as, uh, yesterday, um, Ray tried to make it to this board meeting, but he developed an infection in the incision area. And now we're stuck in the Southern Northern California experience, and I was dreading that phone call. I really was trying to get him an appointment yesterday morning. So I started at about 7.30, and it was my fault that I called the wrong numbers to begin with. When we found the right number about 9 o'clock, 9.15. Um, the staff immediately assigned a Northern California number to him. They were very knowledgeable, rather than we don't know, we can't find you, that we got before. Got the number, the registered nurse uh, screened him. She had him an appointment with a doctor at urgent care within 30 minutes of the phone call. We've never had that happen before. So I just wanted to get, I don't know what Kaiser did. I'm sure it wasn't me opening, spouting my mouth that did something three years ago, but this experience was a 180 degree difference. The facilities are better. There's labor issues, we won't get into that, um, but the labor that is providing the medical care through Kaiser couldn't be any better. So thank you for whatever happened. <laughs> thank you, that's good news indeed. Hope race gets better soon. Okay, that concludes the open session of the Pension and Health Benefits Committee. We are going to adjourn the open session and we're actually going to move into Performance Comp Talent Management Committee in 15 minutes, isn't that next? Then we'll go, we'll go into closed session of the Pension and Health Benefits Committee this afternoon after the workshop. So 15 minutes for performance and comp. Thank you. This meeting of the Performance Compensation Talent Management Committee to order. Uh, first item of business call 
to order. Roll call. Michael Bilbrey. Present. Priya Mother. Morning. Darlene Shell for Julie Chapman. Good morning. Terry McGuire for John Chung. Here. Richard Costigan. Ron Lynn. Here. Grant Boykin for Bill Lockyer. Thank you. Next item is executive report, Mr. Hoffman. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, Doug Hoffner, Calper staff. Uh, before you today in, in open session, um, we have one item. It's on action consent. This is the revision to the executive compensation policy, which the committee and board approved back in, in the spring of this year. What we're bringing uh, before you today is the, the final language in strikeout format uh, for your review and approval under that action item. Um, at the conclusion of this open session, the committee will be moving into closed session where Ms. Hagan uh, will walk through the 12-13 performance um, reports for the investment management positions covered by the board's compensation program. At this point, that concludes my report, unless there are questions from the board. Seeing no questions, we'll move on to item three, consent items. Uh, act these are action items, approval of the minutes and executive compensation, compensation policy revisions. It's a pleasure of the committee. Second. It's been moved by Shell, seconded by Lynn. Uh, to move approval of the uh, consent items. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> item four, consent items. I have had no request to remove any of those. So we will move on to item five, the Human Resources Division Report. Good morning, uh, Katie Hagen, Calper staff. I have nothing to report today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you. Item six, public comment. I received no items of public comment. The board will reconvene in this room in closed session, so I'd ask that those who should not be in the closed session to please temporarily excuse yourself at, as, at the close of this meeting. And with that, we will close the open session and move into closed session as soon as the room is clear. Using for actual evaluations was based on the experience we had between 2002 and 2007. And at that time, we used the scale AA, because it was the, the, the one table available at the time that was uh, available for actuaries to use, and we added five years of mortal mortality improvements into our assumptions using scale AA. So this is what we've done in the past. Going forward, I think this would be if we could do generational mortality improvement but at this time this is not something we can do because of system limitation so any recommendation that will come in front of the board later will be based on a as we've done in the past using a static approach which is based on a fixed number of years so this is what you will see again this year when we bring assumptions hmm? yes that's right so basically with respect to our current system limitations we are We've embarked this year on a, uh, a project to slowly rewrite our computer system, our actual computer system at Calper. So we're currently doing an assess assessment of our current system, and we expect hopefully the next three, four years to have a new system in place, at which time, if we want to go down the path of doing generational mortality improvements, we would be able to. But under today's system, it's not possible. And now, I'll pass it over to Alan. Thank you, David. I'm um, going to talk a little bit about uh, why mortality improvements are needed. Um, and the, the basic reason why we need to include mortality improvements in our actuarial assumptions is really simple. People are living longer. Um, not only are they living longer, the increases in longevity have been continuous. It's not like there was a period when mortality improved um, and it's been static since then. Mortality improvements have been continuous. They haven't been totally uh, stable. There's been times when mortality has improved faster and times when mortality has improved slower. But pretty much for as long as we can see, they have been improving and the improvement has been pretty much continuous. There are some places, some time frames, where you, where you can see uh, reductions in mortality rates um, or reject, reduction in longevity, um, but those are unusual situations, um, and I don't particularly want to go into what they are, but uh, you can probably think of them yourself if you uh, put your mind to it. 
Um, what we've got here is a graph of how mortality has improved, how life expectancy has improved over the course of the 20th century. Now, this is data from Social Security Administration. Uh, they've got a longer, longer historical record than we do, um, and uh, better data and uh, better uh, storage of their data, I think. Um, the red line is female life expectancy at birth. Um, at the uh, left side of the chart, it were, it's the year 1900. At the right side of the chart, it's the year 2000. So you can see, especially in the first half of the 20th century, uh, mortality, longevity was increasing more rapidly than at, at, in the later half of the, the, the century. The blue line is males. You'll see a very similar pattern. Um, and if you look at it, especially in the latter half of the century, you'll see that male mortality has been improving, male longevity has been improving faster than female longevity. The two uh, lines are converging, albeit slightly, but they are converging. Um, these are all factors that we've seen. Um, if you start looking at mortality rates and longevity, this is, these, are, these are very common patterns. Pretty much, you see it pretty much everywhere. This is just a really nice graph to look at it. If you were to only look at longevity during the, of people who are in their retirement years, the, the graph I've shown you is life expectancy at birth you would actually see a somewhat similar pattern um, if you were looking at, say, life expectancy at age 65. The pattern wouldn't be identical. I don't think that the improvements would, would be as rapid in the early part of the, uh, in the first half of the century. Um, but most of the, you know, the mortality improvements in the latter half of the century, um, really the uh, mortality improvement at older ages has been a very significant part of that. So yeah, the, the overall pattern would be the same. I don't know if you'd have as much of a kink in the line if you were looking at life expectancy and sort of at, in the retirement years. Um, one important thing to realize is that this is social security data. So as an actuary, one of the things I always have to think about is what is the population, what is the underlying population? And if you're in pensions, you are almost always dealing with a population that was healthy enough to work through a good portion of their lives, which means that you actually have a slightly better mortality rates than a general population table. One good thing about Social Security data is that it is also people who have generally been healthy enough to work for most of their careers. So in that sense, it's quite similar. Um, it is, however, a little bit different. Um, and you can't necessarily use Social Security data to project um, what you'd get for a retirement system such as Cal um, CalPERS. You know, for example, our membership has better health care than the general Social Security population. Our membership has better pensions and better post-retirement medical. Our population is generally be better educated. Um, so all of these factors do cause differences and they'll come up in a little bit. So we actually took a look at the uh, life expectancies of CalPERS members. Um, these, uh, this data is actually showing the life expectancy um, of an individual retiring at age 55, um, blue for males, red for females, and yes, females live longer than males, um, although we are closing the gap a little bit more obviously in this ga graph. Um, but we, we still have, uh, males still have a ways to go before we catch up to the females. Um, this is our own data out of the last three experience studies and preliminary results out of, uh, out of the uh, current experience study that we're working on right now. Um, and as you can see, the mortality rates are improving. Um, over the last 20 years or so, life expectancy for a new retiree has gone up about two and a half years for males and about one year for females. And so these graphs, what these graphs show is that over the kind of time periods that we are funding a retirement system, we should expect a significant change in life expectancy, something that is really too big to ignore. So I also want, in addition to the basic fundamental reason for projecting mortality improvement, which is that people are living longer, 
We also have um, a concern with respect to our actuarial standards of practice. Actuarial standards of practice do apply to the work that actuaries do. Um, and they apply pretty much to every actuary doing work in the United States. Um, pension, life insurance, whatever. So there's two actuarial standards of practice, what we call ASOPs, that govern the selection of actuarial assumptions in actuarial valuations. Um, ASOP number 27, which is covers the selection of economic assumptions, not really what we're talking about today, and ASOP 35, which governs the selection of demographic assumptions. Um, so the ASOP 35, as I said, um, addresses the selection of assumptions on demographic assumptions uh, for pension plans. It was amended in 2011 to address mortality improvements. And there's a, we've got a quote there from the uh, cover letter uh, that w w came with the, uh, the, the new standard of practice. And it says, as mortality rates have continued to decline over time, concern has increased about the impact of potential future mortality improvements on the magnitude of pension commitments. I also want to give you another quote from the uh, ASOP. The resources reviewed by the pension committee showed that demographic demographers generally expect that mortality will continue to improve. These resources noted that s some scientists argue that human life has biological limits and that the rate of mortality improvement could slow as a result of obesity or other emerging health issues, but that such limits and countervailing factors do not alter the scientific consensus of likely continuing improvement in mortality. Um, I think it's a pretty strong statement, and uh, I believe, absolutely believe, that that is an appropriate and uh, good statement. So under ASOP 35, uh, we do have to consider the effect of mortality improvement bo both prior to and subsequent to the measurement date, the effective date of the valuation, and that the existence of uncertainty about the occurrence or magnitude of more future mortality improvements is not a reason to assume no future mortality improvements. Um, under our actuarial standards of practice, we have to make actuarial assumptions that are reasonable. And while we can, I'm trying to think if I got, nope. While we can um, make use a prescribed assumption, which is to say an assumption mandated by an entity that has the power to mandate an assumption, which in our context is the board of administration, you have the power to mandate an actuarial assumption. So while we can use those in, in our actuarial valuations, if it is not a reasonable assumption, uh, an actuary will be required to qualify their actuarial valuation and issue a qualified actuarial valuation and quantify how much of a difference the results would be if you were to use a reasonable assumption. And uh, from my perspective, not including mortality projection is not a reasonable assumption. So continuing forward with no assumption about mortality improvement will require a qualified actuarial valuation report. And that will have consequences on the financial statements of both our system as well as our any um, participating employers' financial statements. Come on. So, and poor, more, projecting mortality improvements are necessary to ensure the proper funding of the system. That is the main reason why we should be doing mortal, including mortality improvements. It is necessary to avoid liability losses. It's necessary to comply with our actuarial standards of practice. And failure to reflect mortality improvements will result in sh the shifting of costs into the future. Uh, the phrase that is used is kicking the can down the road. We try very hard not to do it, and I think we should continue to try very hard not to kick the co any cost. Another question, and probably the more interesting question, is how much mortality improvement should we be projecting? Before I go there, are there any questions on the previous section? Priya? 
Yeah, just one. You mentioned a number of items that imp that for make the CalPERS population have better mortality than um, Social Security mortality um, scale. But one of the things that we hear a lot in um, health benefits is that our membership is actually less healthy than the rest of the population. So I'm wondering if, if you've considered that on the other side. Um, I, th I think, you, we, again, we really need to be thinking about what is the underlying population. When you compare our population to other populations covered by employer health care, um, that's actually a subset of the Social Security population. Mm -hmm. And that subset may actually have, may really have better mortality rates, better uh, morbidity rates, than uh, better health outcomes than our CalPERS membership. Um, but when you compare it to the overall Social Security covered population, a lot of them don't have health care. Now, what the new um, health care exchanges under the Accountable Care Act, um, what, a very interesting question is how is that going to impact general mortality improvements? It shouldn't affect our population because they're pretty much all covered already. Um, but it may, uh, one question I have is, is scale B be enough for other populations? Um, or are we going to see an acceleration of mortality improvements outside of um, our population? I think that's a very real possibility, I think, but fortunately that's something that somebody else has to worry about, not, not me. Um, <laughs> and, and a good thing, I might add. I just wanted to say also as an aside um, that uh, this is very much in the, this topic is very much in the air right now. In fact, there's a new watch called the Ticker Watch. I don't know if everybody's heard about this, which basically you, you fill out a questionnaire and it, about your lifestyle and it counts down your death <laughs> on this watch. <laughs> um, and they're, they're actually seeking venture funding for anybody who's interested, but um, anyway, I just, think, I just wanted to share. Uh, uh, not only do I not think I'm gonna be going there, I, don't, I definitely wanna make sure I don't go there with uh, and have Lamro beside me when I do it. Because uh, not only is he younger, he's also a little bit healthier than I am. Although playing hockey, you know, maybe maybe that'll offset some of the uh, differences. <laughs> okay, um, so David talked a little bit about Scale BB. I want to talk a little bit more about Scale BB. Uh, Scale BB was really developed on the basis of uh, Social Security data. Um, and so some of these issues that I talked about earlier about the differences between our membership and the, the membership, the population that underlies Social Security are very relevant here. Um, but what is important is this is people who are healthy enough to work. Um, so it's, it's very relevant to what we have, you know, our situation here. Um, this Scale BB is an industry-wide table. It's used uh, both in the public and private sector, um, used in both, I, um, I shouldn't say it's used in Canada, I don't really know, um, but certainly scale AA, which was the predecessor, was widely used in Canada as well as the United States. So this really is a very broad-based uh, mortality improve, uh, assumption about future mortality improvements. Um, scale BB was interesting because the committee that developed scale BB asked for, asked a number of organizations for data to contribute to their study, and we elected to contribute some of our data to the study. They did not develop the, the improvement scale based on our data. They developed the improvement scale based on Social Security data. Then they checked their results against two sources of data, one, the federal retirement system, and two, us, our data. And what they found was that our data supported the general, what they were doing in the way of uh, putting a specific table out, and in particular, extending the mortality improvements for longer in, into higher ages. Um, we've, if you actually look at the um, Scale BB report, you'll see a graph very much like this one I've got on the screen right now. Uh, the green line is Scale BB, and that wiggly orange line is the uh, mortality improvements that we saw in our own data. This is for males, um, and as you can see, at pretty much every age, especially the ages in the key 
60 to 85 range, which is where mortality rates impact pensions the most. Our improvements have significantly exceeded the mortality improvements that are projected by Scale BB. And I can tell you this graph is giving me a bit of heartburn in terms of what to recommend in the way of future mortality improvements. This is the graph for females. Uh, very similar results, although, and, and in fact, if you look carefully at this, you'll see that, yeah, we're seeing higher mortality improvements amongst our population than the scale BB. It's not as dramatic as for males, not nearly as dramatic as for males. Um, and they are projecting lower mortality improvements uh, under scale BB for females anyway. Um, but both of these suggest that if we were to only look at our own historical data, we would be projecting mortality improvements greater than scale BB would, would suggest. Alan? Yes? Why the volatility in our experience? Volatility in our experience is just due to uh, the essentially the limited amount of data that we have. Um, so it's noise? It's noise, right. Wh what you should get out of that graph is even after you subtract the noise, you're really seeing higher rates. You're welcome. Um, oh, so, Alan, can, can you, so I, I think I understand how the annual improvement factor works on your mortality tables, but can you, but you know, without doing something, how does it translate into life expectancy? Is there any sort of simple, if, if there's a, 2% is the <clears throat> improvement, let's say, for males. What does that mean for life? Can you speak to life expectancy at, at age 60 will, or so? I will get to life expectancy in a very short oh, okay. while. All right. <laughs> uh, so the future is uncertain. We do not know whether mortality rates will continue to improve according to what we have seen in our data for the last 15 years? Or will it can improve more like the underlying, the scale BB, this broader based table? Or will it be slower than that? We don't know. Um, there is a risk of either over or under projecting. Um, what we, certainly my objective is to give you the best possible recommendation I can as to the level of future mortality improvement we know it will be wrong. That's why George and I are going to have coffee 30 years from now um, and check out to see how, how close we got it. Um, but there are some things that we need to think about. First one that I'm going to talk, well, actually I'm going to talk about this probably not first, but smoking prevalence and how that impacts future mortality improvements. Talk about that in a little bit. Medical breakthroughs. Medical breakthroughs could happen there's a certain amount of medical breakthrough anticipated in the underlying more, the scale BB, but they're certainly not expecting anything radical. If there is a radical breakthrough in, in, uh, in the health field, well, we're going to be wrong. And I'll be uh, explaining to George why I was wrong 30 years from now. Um, but the more, t you know, we simply cannot predict this. This is not predictable. We cannot predict it. We do not build it into the, uh, the concept of a radical breakthrough into our mortality um, assumption. We don't think that's appropriate. We think the best thing to do is to assume kind of a ongoing, relatively small improvements um, in healthcare the way we've seen it for, for generations. Um, that's what we're going to do. We are not assuming anything radical in the way of medical breakthroughs. I think people tend to overestimate the impact of, say, cancer is completely eliminated, competing risks. It doesn't add that much to it. It adds if you're the person who got it, but it doesn't add that much. The other is obesity. Um, at age 65 or so, it's it uh, doesn't hurt you very much. In fact, the worst thing is to be underweight at age 65. It may hurt you in getting to 65, but if you so, take it. Obesity and uh, diabetes are often cited as reasons why we should expect to see lower rates of mortality improvement in the future. Um, lots of discussion of this in the literature. Um, there's a fairly, uh, this is uh, 
referenced in um, both the uh, Social Security Trustees Report and the report of the technical Social Security Technical Panel, which is a different group that did takes a look at uh, Social Security assumptions. A bit of a back and forth between them. Um, basically, this factor is anticipated to reduce the rate of mortality improvement in the future. It's already built into the, the, the underlying table. Um, the, the consensus seems to be that while it will reduce the rates of mortality improvement, it will not fully offset the other one, all of the other factors, um, and so we are going to continue to see mortality improvement. So this factor is already built into scale BB. Um, so not something I'm going. I, I think would be appropriate to make any changes because of. The fourth factor, socioeconomic status, is really very interesting. Um, for our purposes, that really what we're really talking about is education and income and really access to med good medical care. Um, our population probably does have um, you know, better indicators in that regard than the general Social Security population. Um, what studies have found is that people with higher socioeconomic status have better mortality improvements. Their, mort their rates of mortality improvement are higher than other populations. Now that could be one of the reasons behind what we just saw a few slide, uh, slides ago where our rates of improvement are higher than scale BB. Um, and if that is an explanation and if that trend continues on into the future, that is something that suggest, would suggest that we should be using even higher rates of mortality improvement than scale BB. Let's uh, talk a little bit about smoking. The reduction in smoking rates in the United States has been a significant driver of improvement for many years. Now, what we've got here is um, a graph from, David, do you remember who generated this? California Department of Public Health. Um, California Department of Public Health, and it shows the rates, prevalence of smoking amongst both the California population and the United States population, excluding California. And as you can see, the two lines, the, the green dots are the United States excluding California, and the orange, orange dots and orange line are the California population. As you can see, both have been going down continuously. But what's really kind of interesting is at the end of this period, smoking rates in California are down to about 10%. And I can pretty much guarantee you that they won't improve, they won't drop by more than about another 10%. Because um, they may go to zero, but they ain't going into negative territory. Um, and in fact, it seems unlikely that they will even get down to zero because there seems to be some minimal level of smoking that in almost any population. So it may be reasonable to assume that smoking rates are going to continue to decline another 5% or so in California, but there's, there's not as much room for future improvement in California as there is in the rest of the country. And this is, if there's one reason why we might want to think about using less mortality improvement for our population than what is used for the general U.S. population, this is the only good reason I've, you know, this is a good reason, but it's really the only reason that I've come across that really makes me think that this is something that we should be really thinking long and hard about. So the two things that are really kind of, I'm weighing, in terms of making a recommendation is the socioeconomic status versus the smoking rates. So what are we likely to recommend in the way of projecting mortality improvements come December? Well, we are likely to use scale BB or some sort of variation from scale BB. It might be X percent of scale BB, or scale BB projected a certain period, but it's likely to be based off of scale BB. It is the standard table. We really should 
use the standard table. It's, it helps for comparability. It's also a matter of a lot of thought went into that table from a lot of folks, um, and we should just take advantage of that. We are very likely to recommend a static improvement, just improving it a certain number of years, um, mostly because we can't do generational. I would love to recommend generational mortality improvements, but my systems can't handle it, at least not yet. Uh, the question that remains is sort of how many years to project on into the future. We need to project about seven years just to get our mortality rates up to the period that we will be using this new table for. Um, five years is what we've done in the past. Something like um, 20 years of projection, 20, 22 years, will be equivalent to generational mortality. That is, the impact on contributions would be about the same as if we were to implement generational mortality projection. Um, if we use anything less than that, say 15 year static projection of scale BB, it will be because we are expecting to see lower rates of mortality improvement than in the U.S. population in general. So this is a chart you've seen before, um, although I've sort of scrunched it to the left there. Um, basically, basically, the mortality life expectancies from the last three experience studies and the one that we're working on currently. If we just project an extra five years, we're, we're looking at uh, what we've got here. Uh, female life expectancy at 86, male life expectancy at just over 83. 10 years, uh, so a total of 15 year projection or 20 years. Um, so this last one would be kind of full-scale BB, or at least the equivalent of that. And we're looking at uh, basically about age 87, the life expectancy for a female retiring at age 55 would be about just less than age 87, and life expectancy for a male retiring at age 55 would be uh, about 84 and a half years. Yes? Could you come back for a moment to, uh, you, you made a comment that you would like to do generational, but you can't do it because your systems wouldn't do it. Is this a technology issue? Is this a personnel issue or what? It's a technology issue and one that we are already uh, working to address. Um, it'll take some time for us to get the uh, new systems in place, um, but we're already working on modernizing our actual evaluation system, and this will definitely be part of what we include in the modernized system. And you would expect that to occur by when? Um, I don't expect to come back with a new recommendation on our demographic or economic assumptions for four years. I expect to okay. have it in place in time for that. Thank you. Any other questions before I hand it over to David? Thanks. Alan is giving me the fun part now the potential impact on rates. Uh, the main thing to keep in mind is now with, ent with pension reform last year, we've now entered a new era where each time the board will be considering approving new actual assumptions, whether it's the discount rate mortality, it now has the potential for impacting members take home pay. Because pension reform with the passage of PEPRA last year, a new provision was added that new PEPRA member have to pay 50% of the normal cost, the, the cost of the benefit. And the law says that in any year, if, if the normal cost changes by more than 1%, the members are supposed to pick up half of it. So from now on, anytime we're going to be looking at assumption changes, in the past we've brought to you, here's the potential impact to employer rates, you're now also going to see if this change is going to impact members or not. So this is something new that you will start to see for the first time this time around. will provide you the potential impact on member rates. JJ. Is it the member rate changes if it's an increase of more than 1% of payroll? Is that cumulative or each individual year? Our understanding and how we, we plan to implement it is it's from the last time the member rate was set. So last December, after PEPRA passed, we sent a letter to all of the employers that, that contract with CalPERS and told them, for example, your normal cost for the new PEPRA benefit is 12%. 
So your new mem the new PEPRA members you hire will have to pay six. So the next time every year, so, so the normal cost may go up to 12 and a half. But the moment it hits 13, so it's, it's the moment it's changed by 1% from the last time the member rate was set. Okay, thank you. The other thing to keep in mind is, as you're gonna see on the other chart, is the impact is gonna be different from all the employers. If you look the last time around, when we did the experiment study, when the board approved new demographic assumptions back in 2010, uh, as part of the uh, approval, we adopted new, the board adopted new mortality rates that the impact, for example, at the time, because the life expectancy for males had gone up uh, faster than for female, all of our safety plans that have a higher proportion of males saw a much bigger impact on their contribution rates than for the non-safety. So the same thing, you know, the main point here is the impact is going to be different for all of the plans. So first you've got the demographics, the mix of male and female is going to play a big role. Also, the what we refer to as a ratio of liability to payroll, mostly how mature is the plan. A plan that has more retirees is likely to see a bigger impact. So we've, we've run some numbers just to give everyone an idea of what the impact would be for 10, 15, or 20 years of mortality improvement. In all three cases, the change in normal cost would not be enough to trigger a, an increase in member rate by itself. So we want to point out that the chart that we just handed out to you Correct. is different from the uh, chart that we had in the, uh, in the presentation on your iPads. Um, we will get this fixed on the, um, on the website as well. Um, you had the same one as was posted on the web, so if yours is wrong, so is the uh, one on the web. Uh, so we will get that updated. Um, this was, we had a transcription error, uh, or a cut and paste error, that uh, gave us the wrong, uh, wrong information. Thanks, yes. Basically, the version on your iPad has five, 10, and 15 years. So if you're wondering what five would do, you have it in front of you in the column that says 10. So everything was kind of shifted to the left. Anyway, so you can kind of see the, the range here. What we did is we picked 10 simple plans, 10 of our employers, and look at what the range would be. And you can see you know, the difference between 10, 15, and 20, and even within that. And now what's different also, the other thing I want to point out, when the board adopted the new smoothing methods back in April, uh, what we refer to as the direct rate smoothing, where we say now we're going to phase in over five years the impact of gains and losses. It also had built into it a five-year, an automatic five-year phase in of any assumption changes, which is why here what we've done is we've shown if, if let's say the board were to approve 10 years of mortality improvement, the, we're showing the impact in year one of the phase in and what the ultimate impact will be at the end of the phase in. So this is that's those are the last two rows in the table there. And the other thing I want to point out with respect to the member rate, this is only for mortality assumption only. Uh, we are still reviewing, reviewing the other assumptions, but we don't know yet if the combination of all of the changes would trigger a change of more than 1%. So we're still looking at that right now. And we'll be able to tell you more in December. So the last thing, yes. Just the, um, the percentage impact, let's take year six. Um, is um, okay. the higher would be for like safety, 6.4 percent. Um, the well, the well, I don't know the retiring younger makes a difference or not. Anyway, that's what the reason for the yeah. And on this one, is. the 6.4, the, the the I think George is referring to the highest number we've got on the in, on the table. Uh, I don't know if you want to call it an outlier, but it's for one of our plan that oh. has a very large retiree base. The reason we, we, we picked that plan on purpose to kind of get an idea, but we, have, we know we have some plans that are an, have an even bigger retiree base. So some may see an even bigger increase than that, but I would say that the most of them will be on the lower part of that range than the upper part. Yeah. But it's still a drastic impact. Okay. Good. Ralph. Um, on the, the chart, you know, you're indicating no impact on the um, member rate. Is that for year one or is there a cumulative effect? Because I can see there's like a cumulative effect for the employer rate. Does that eventually catch um, 
to where the normal cost impact is enough to trigger the member rate? No, basically the only part that's phased in is the payment toward the unfunded liability. So the normal cost is reflected in the rate right away. And what we're showing here is the normal cost, even the 20 year of mortality improvements would increase at, in the range we've looked at the most 0.8. Uh, I think we're slowly ran out of time. Uh, just if you want to refer to it later, the, the next part we had was more to see a comparison with what other retirement systems are doing. And I think to maybe refer back to a bit what Priya said before, probably the most of interesting thing here is we've put a chart where you can see uh, the, the blue line is our, our current re, uh, mortality rate assumption compared to what some other retirement systems are doing in the U.S. is what we show first. And then later we've got the same chart but for California systems. And you can kind of see that And when you look at the U.S., as you would expect, I think generally everywhere you read, folks in California live longer than the rest of the nation, you can kind of see it on the first chart where you can see our mortality rates tend to be on the lower range of all the systems in the U.S. Uh, this is the California chart which seem to indicate that today in the most recent valuations that we have and also the ones we could find from other systems, we are today on the, uh, we use slightly higher mortality rates than some of the other systems. And I think Alan's got some closing comments. So Grant, I'm, just after this, I'm going to question. So <laughs> I'll call on you first. Um, closing comments. Uh, certainly, I think that mortality improvement is necessary. It's necessary for us to project mortality improvements um, to ensure the proper funding of the system. And the, the real questions are how much improvement to build into our funding and how quickly to build that into the employer rates. Um, that's what we think is the, uh, the real issues. Um, this is the overall timeline. It's the timeline for our whole ALM process. It's out there. Key points, we're bringing the actual recommendation in December, asking the board for a decision in February. So certainly we'd like stakeholder input between now and then. And with that, I'll go for questions. And Grant, you're first up. Thank you. That last comment went to my question, which was the timeline. So I assume if we adopt that in February, you would want to put, build that into the 14, 15 state and schools? Right? I'm still thinking about what my recommendation is going to be with respect to all of the assumption changes. Uh, certainly, I very much like the idea of building it into employers' projected rates. Um, and then only after that, building it into their, their actual rates. If we were to do that, that would mean that we would build it into the projected rates and the valuations that we prepare in 2014, which would mean that it would impact the state schools rates in 2015-16 and public agency rates in 16-17. Thank you. But I'm yep. still thinking about that one. Is that really what I want to do? Uh, we'll, I'll give you a recommendation in December. And with options? Options and, for implementation. And with options. Yeah. Options for implementation. Any other questions? Well, what's the rule again about member rates? The whole, the, if the normal cost increase is 1% or more, then the, then the employee rate is impacted. So for the PEPRA formulas, the people covered under the new PEPRA formulas, if the normal cost, if the cumulative changes of normal cost, basically since you were initially set it up, result in more than a 1% increase in the normal cost, that, or increase or decrease in the normal cost, then you make a change to the member contribution rate. So it would obviously be about a half a percent when you first get, when it gets triggered. But it's really a cumulative impact of all of the things that have changed. So they will have some demographic changes. Maybe they, their hiring practices are different and they start to hire slightly older people, uh, sl slightly older employees. That means that their normal cost will be going up because of that reason. Um, so if the cumulative impact of all things that cause changes in normal costs result in more than a 1% change, that triggers it. And so what this means is that at this point, because so little has happened between the implementation of PEPRA and 
you know, we, we can fairly comfortably say this isn't likely to cause a member contribution rate change. But as time goes on, we will not be able to answer that question because different employers will be in different places, they'll have had a different history, th different things will have happened, and we will simply not be able to sort of say definitively, yes, this will, or no, this will not impact the, the employer normal, the normal cost um, and the member contributions. But it really is just for um, PEPRA members, although the provision in PEP, the provision in PEPRA that applies to current members does allow the employer to impose a member contribution rate increase in 2018, I think it is, if I recall correctly, and that's up to half the normal cost. So while this wouldn't automatically re reflect uh, affect their contribution rate, the member contribution rate, it could change the level to which the employer could impose. So very, this is kind of really a complex answer. It's almost, you almost need to look at it on a plan by plan basis to really get a good answer. It looked, I just looked to me like you must be pushing the 1% and it's close to, so I mean, we're talking about a life expectancy increase of somewhere around two and a half years or something for the, for the 20 year mortality improvements. And, uh, then I, then I just tried to estimate what that was in present value of the benefit. I mean, this is back of a talking points analysis. I didn't have an envelope handy. Yeah. Um, so, uh, <laughs> it, but it looked to me like, you know, the present value would be up, would have gone up somewhere in the 6%. And so normal cost is 15%. You would be getting around, by this alone, you'd be getting close to that. We're, we're thinking that at the upper end, we're looking at about eight tenths of a percent. So you're right. We are potentially pushing that 1% limit. We're, yeah. get, we're certainly getting, we're getting somewhat close to it, especially for those plans that for, have a bigger impact, and it wouldn't take much else to trigger a member contribution rate change. Any other questions, Priya? I'm sorry, just one more question about that. Once, um, once that is triggered, is that an extra half a percent in perpetuity, or does it get adjusted just the next time there's a 1% change, either up or down, that's when it would get adjusted again? It's Correct. It, it's essentially, it's the new normal, and at a 1% increase in the norm, increase or decrease in the normal cost would then be required to trigger a subsequent change. And how much do you think employers understand this provision of PEMCA? And are we planning on any education of, of employers around this? First, I'd better say PEPRA, not PEMCA. I'm sorry, PEPRA <laughs> is what I meant. <laughs> We've got PEMCA on the mind, but I meant PEPRA. Um, yeah, are we planning any education of, of employers around this issue? Um, I think that we will try to, if we do, if it is making an impact on the member contribution rate change, uh, we will be identifying that in the valuation reports and letting each employer know individually. Uh, in terms of an education campaign, um, I'm not, I haven't really uh, put much thought into that right now. I'm still trying to figure out what the basic recommendation should be, but it might be worthwhile doing some education. As you kind of heard, it's so complicated that it almost requires a plan-by-plan -plan analysis, which the best place to do that would be in the actual evaluation report. Yeah, but there might be some decisions that employers are making that that will impact this one percent of normal cost that they might not be aware is you know could have an impact. So they should know before it before it impacts them. And actually, I would say not just employers, but mm -hmm. but member organizations as well probably are not really aware of this the impact the potential impact of this provision. Um, so a it, webinar it, might be in order. I don't know. Just a thought. It, it is a it is a new provision that I think we're all trying to grapple with. Just what does this mean? Um, we've probably put more thought into it than most, so we, we're probably in a good position to help educate others. Um, that's probably a good idea. Thank you. Okay, I guess no other questions. we're done. So I well, thank you very much. Very good job. Thank you. Closed session of Pension and, <laughs> Pension and Health Benefits Committee will start in 15 minutes at, uh, let's say, 20 of the hour.